What's up guys, I'm Dave Klein, and today we're going to talk about the land of Eliam Lois and its Ivory King, how this land came to be, how it would eventually fall, and its fearful queen. It's time to talk about the Dark Souls 2 Ivory King DLC. A long time ago, before the existence of the lands of Drangleic, Ferosa, and Eliam Lois, there was a land called Isolith. Isolith, a part of Lordran, was home to the Witch of Isolith and her seven daughters of Chaos. During the Age of Ancients, a time of stone everlasting dragons, grey crags and arc trees, the first flame began, and from the first flame came despair. Amongst this, the Witch of Isolith inherited a lord soul, a soul filled with life. The soul gave her power, and along with her daughters, the witches spun fire sorceries to help take out the dragons and burn down their homes. And for a time, her people prospered. They thrived underground in the land of Isolith. But all is cyclical, and soon, the fire began to fade. With the fading fire came the accursed undead, and like the dragons, they too were everlasting. As the Lord's way of life began to shatter and falter before them, the Witch of Isolith devised a plan to use her Lord Soul of Life to create a new flame, a new hope that could extend their reign. But to create life itself, and to fight the cyclical nature of the world was too much. She overestimated herself and her powers, and soon, the flame went out of control and chaos erupted. Instead of creating life anew, this chaos flame corrupted all life within its reach, turning the inhabitants of chaos into demons, and the witch herself into the bed of chaos, and the mother of all demons. But those were events of long, long ago. This land is barren, cursed by the old chaos. It gave birth to atrocities, and the people fled in fear, until our lord, the Ivory King, came. The Ivory King was an inhabitant of the eastern warring land of Ferosa. It is said that the Ivory King was once the highest ranking knight in his home of Ferosa, famed for its god of war. After taking his crown, they say he was the first to swing his sword in times of need, be it for his homeland or his people. While the Ivory King hailed from Ferosa, it's unclear as to whether Eliam Lois, a land far to the north, was part of the kingdom of Ferosa, or a separate state. But given the Ivory King's fierce loyalty to his homeland, I believe that Eliam Lois was connected in some integral way to Ferosa and presented a threat to its inhabitants. That threat being a chaotic flame of old, one that is still corrupting life to this day. The Ivory King traveled to that land, a land far to the north where he built a great cathedral to appease the raging flame. In fact, the land of Eliam Lois was a vast rampart built to contain the ancient chaos. The Ivory King placed his throne upon that very mouth of chaos and served as the first line of defense. My dear lord, a most true king. It was with his magnificent soul that he built Eliam Lois and contained the spread of chaos. In the Ivory King's guardianship over the ancient chaos, the land of Eliam Lois was erected around him, and I believe the Ivory King, a king who was first to swing his sword in times of need, be it for his homeland or his people, did so in order to protect his homeland of Ferosa. Unlike what we've seen with the Iron King, it seems the Ivory King was the opposite, an incredibly kind and caring ruler whose first priority was his people. He was ever merciful and devoted himself to the protection of his great land. Given the magnitude of Eliam Lois, it seems an entire city and way of life sprung around the Ivory King, and he reigned for a decent amount of time. A tradition of priestesses began, who devoted themselves to appeasing the ancient flame. These priestesses also had retainers who attended to their needs. The first priestess who watched over Eliam Lois had a special eye, allowing her to see the unseen, and all the great priestesses following replaced one of their birth eyes with this, returning it after their term was complete indicating enough time passed for this to become a tradition. A great protective wall was erected to protect Eliam Lois from the encroaching chaos, and the various sorcerers were among its defenders. 
walls were built around the city, which I believe were built in order to keep the flame in and from spreading to other parts of the kingdom. It was during this time that Alsana, the silent oracle, and another fragment of Manus found the Ivory King. Alsana, who was an augur of fear, quietly found a place at the Ivory King's side. The Ivory King cared so deeply for Alsana, he set one of his pets, Ava, to guard her. Each of the Ivory King's seven beasts was conferred a specific duty. Ava's was the guardianship of the king's beloved child of dark. Unlike the other fragments of Manus, it seems Alsana was a caring soul who truly loved her king and his men, and when the Ivory King sensed the degradation of his soul, he left without a word, leaving everything to Alsana, who had unbeknownst found a place at his side. But the chaos would not be sated, and the king gave his own soul. Inevitably, the king was drained of figure and plunged into the chaos's heart. The king's plan to watch over the chaos had worked for a time, but eventually, it had to come to his last resort. His throne, having been set up as a final defense to the ancient chaos, served as his battleground. The king called forth his various Lois knights who were commanded to strike down each malformed terror that arose from the chaos, and they would not hesitate even if it were their own king. So determined to help his people, and so determined to stop this looming threat, the king commanded his own men to kill him if he himself became corrupted. And fortunately, the knights were worthy successors to their king. The Knights of Lois were devoted guardians of this land that delved valiantly into the depths of chaos never to return. They were taken by chaos and lost all sense of purpose and being. To this day, they still burn in agony alongside their once proud king. The few woeful souls that trudged back home were guided by some faint vestige of self. These few survivors remain in Elium Lois, now frozen over awaiting the call of their master. But even with the strength of his knights, the king failed to put an end to the chaos. Aleam Lois existed to subdue the raging flame, but when the ivory gates were flung open, the land grew cold and lifeless. I believe after the king failed, they opened the gates to the outside world in order to let the frigid outside tundra and nature put a stop to the spread of chaos. And so, Alsana, the silent oracle and augur of fear, lost the only one who she'd found acceptance with and devoted her life to his dying wish. She remained alone to watch over the dead land, protecting it from the interference of outsiders and ensuring the chaos remain within. This child of dark, in reverence of the apocalypse, devotes herself to a ritual in hopes of appeasing the raging flame. The Leon Lois was frozen in time. Its leader lost. I remain here to contain the chaos, honoring my lord's wishes. Perhaps one day he will return. There is nothing here save that accursed flame. We know Ferosa would eventually fall to war, but given how powerful Ferosa was known to be, and given the skill their various warriors were renowned for, I think it's possible the Ivory King's downfall and these events of Ferosa's downfall could be linked. Sir Fabian led the Knights of Alium Lois straight into the depths of chaos to exterminate the terrible things that dwelled there, but not one of the selfless knights returned. If Elium Lois could be considered a part of Ferosa, that means a large portion of its soldiers were lost in fighting the chaos, weakening the state and possibly leading to its eventual downfall. Now, this entire theory relies on the idea that Elium Lois is indeed a part of the Kingdom of Ferosa, which heavily relies on your own interpretation. A big question we get in visiting the land of Elium Lois harkens to the golems that can be found. The golems seem to be the same as the ones King Vendrick used at Drangolet Castle, however, this time attacking the player. Does that mean King Vendrick is somehow connected to Elium Lois? Personally, I think that's hard to say, as there isn't really any evidence that I could find suggesting one case or the other. Due to the lack of evidence, I tend to veer on the side that Vendrick and Elium Lois aren't connected. However, lack of evidence does not equal proof, and I honestly can't say one way or another. 
The final big question brought forth is if L.A. Amlois is a future version of Isolith from Dark Souls 1. The imagery of the spread of chaos is heavily reminiscent of Dark Souls' Bed of Chaos, and the location of the Ivory King fight, with its lava and extending chaos branches, also calls forth Isolith. Personally, I think it's very likely Elium Lois was built on top of Isolith, and this is the future location. If you believe Elium Lois is a continuation and part of Drangleic, that could help to prove Drangleic is actually both a crumbled and rebuilt Lordran. Both are far to the north, so they could be connected. On the other hand, it could be a northern state of Ferosa, so it's hard to say. Alright guys, that wraps up this Dark Souls 2 lore video on the Ivory King DLC and Elium Lois. Do you believe Elium Lois is built on top of Isolith? And furthermore, where do you place Elium Lois? As part of Drangleic, an extension of Ferosa, or something else entirely? If you missed any DLC lore, make sure to check out my other videos on that very subject, as I've made videos talking about both the Iron King and Sunken King DLCs. Also, as it's October, I finished another super show discussing Castlevania, just in time for Halloween. Check it out if you had the chance. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace. And in preparation for Halloween, I thought it'd be the perfect time to bust out one of the most classic horror games, Castlevania. Castlevania first released in Japan in September 1986, only one year after the release of the legendary Super Mario Bros. It showed that a game could take platform elements of Super Mario Bros., but avoid being a complete ripoff. And apart from Mario, it even featured a mature and realistic visual design. Now that's the realism I look for.